Ross Corman would have been off and running. Runners at second to third. Ronnie Gamer to follow. He got an open base. Can it rise and go to pitch fairly carefully, I would guess, for Dodd Corman. Never a chance for Jack Kars to throw that one. Mark Gamer is at second base. Ross Kornman is at third base. Pitch is up and in. Knute Ryerson missing again on Todd Kornman. Kornman the cleanup hitter. Ryerson in a hurry. Strike going. Pump that one right through there to waste on the outside corner. Now things looking more and more like a Moobridge Cardinal night here itself. Here's the pitch. Swing at a high chop back toward the mound. Ryerson will feel it halfway toward third base. Fire on to see fielder retire the side. So a mild cardinal threat goes by the board. There were no runs on one hit, no errors, and two left. We move to the bottom of the ninth. It's the last call for the Selby Lakers. They trail the Cardinals 3-0. All wrapped in 30 seconds. Gary Burke. Tigers hawking that defense pretty good. They've pushed the battlers out of their offense here in the early going. Welcome to all of you Battler fans that have joined us. The basketball fortunes of the Gettysburg Battlers are looking up, not only this year, but over the next couple of years. Herrick's around the ring. Goes to the post to Allmeyer. Baseline right, power move, Allmeyer. He's in trouble. Fisher steals it. We got a jump ball called. It will go back to the Battlers. Allmeyer went through the paint. The Tigers doubled him down low, forced the jump ball. Allmeyer will inbound the basketball. 5 0 Mobridge. We're at 6.51 here. Battlers having trouble getting things going. Allmeyer this is the story the of a great side. man, a man that brought color to every life that he touched, including mine. It is my honor and privilege to bring you the story of the voice of the Tigers, Pat Morrison. This is Spencer Gosh. When I was a kid, my parents would take me to ball games, and every now and again, there was Pat. He'd be sitting on the stage with a large clipboard in hand, talking into the microphone as if he was talking to the world. Aside from fouling my dad out a few games as a referee, he didn't know who I was or where I came from, but it didn't matter. Play-by-play -play was his art, and the airwaves were his canvas. He came to many of our homes through our radios, and for many, he crawled right into our hearts. He didn't know it then, but that four-year-old running around the sidelines around him would one day be inspired to follow in his footsteps, for at that time, I knew that's what I wanted to do, and he was who I wanted to be. Many of us don't get to finish our stories by saying that one day we get to work side-by-side -side with our heroes, but I did. Working with him at the radio for the past 17 years has been a dream come true. I got to know Pat, and I know that he would tell me that if he knew I was doing this, he would say, Spence, don't sap it up. Hell, nobody wants to hear some sob story about an old radio broadcaster. So that's not what I'm going to do. With the help of his right hands, and some could say the only daughters he ever had, Don and Cindy, and the rest of the good folks at the radio station, we are going to bring you tales of this great man from friends and family that he has touched. Now, due to time constraints, we weren't able to get to everyone, but you are all with us in making this tribute. Here is a story of the great man called Pat Morrison. For the listeners in this area, the sports have always been surrounded by one man. A man that started his legendary career by being a part of one of only two boys basketball state championships for Mobridge High School. He played baseball and competed at a high level at the University of Michigan, where he received his degree in journalism. You've been in the radio business and uh, calling basketball game, uh, games for how long? Well, since 1956. Do the math on that. And that ain't all. I started refereeing basketball in 1951 and worked, I don't know, a zillion high school basketball games as a referee. And then if you want to go way back to the dawn of time, right here in Mobridge House High School, we've got two state Class B basketball championships and I played on both of those teams back in the early 40s. So I've been around forever. Well, and the beauty of it is now, every year my exploits get better because all of the people that, who could basically uh, contradict me are either in the home up on the hill or out in Greenwood Cemetery, you see. <laughs> right. I've outlived all my critics, almost. Well, I used to have kids say, that you refereed for my dad. And then I said, the first one that says you refereed for my grandfather, I'll quit. Well, I've had a number of people tell me that over the years, so I've been around a long time. Exactly. Uh, we do all, we do here at, uh, well, the Star 99, really, we do all of the Mobridge 
Tiger football games, and all of the girls' basketball and the boys' basketball games. I've been doing that for a number of years. And then I've done eight tons of basketball other than that and done a lot of baseball. And You've been around as long as I have. You've done it all. <laughs> Whenever anyone gets around to asking my age, I tell them my age, which I'd be happy to tell you, and, and they always say to me, well, Pat, you're, you're well-preserved for your age. And my stock answer is, of course I am. You want to see the people my age? I'll take you out to Greenwood Cemetery here <laughs> in Fall Ridge or to, to the home up on the hill, show you some of my own girlfriends. Well, I've been around a long time. And incidentally, and I'm the one indispensable guy here at KOLY. <laughs> I'm not worth a crap, but I work cheap. He served his country as a member of the United States Army. It was that I was in the service and over in Japan for a year. Now you guys don't know that, but I say all kinds of people, even now, like this came up and they said, you were in the service? I said, well, yes, I was over in Japan for, for, for a year. And I don't know, see what happened. Even in after the war. Well, here's what happened, in, in a nutshell. I graduated in 43, and everybody was getting drafted, and it was just a deal. And I said, hell, I'll be in. And so we all go down to go to Fort, down to Fort Selling. That's where they examine everybody. And this good doctor, there's shit. They got a big. They got, oh, you get. The, they got a big line, and he's asking me questions. He said, "You ever had any uh, sinus uh, uh, trouble and hay fever?" And I said, "Well, yeah, I've had a little of this and that." And I didn't think anything about it. It was kind of a cold day. So all of our papers come back over here, and here's mine with this red line drawn in it. So I can't get in. So I went back twice, and, and of course. What's it? Well, what what you got on that list? You couldn't get back in. So now I say, well, what the hell? I guess I'm not going to go to the service. So I went to School of Mines for a year, and uh, and I was out there for a year. And and uh, a guy that, that played the Rapid City City League, and a guy that would coach that air base team said, you want to go somewhere and play? That's how I ended up at up at Michigan. I was up there four years, but but that but that business would be a bit of the service, and I was in there. Well, for over over a year, near a year, over Japan, and the war was just winding down. That's what I thought. You well, just but I'm saying the, the reason I brought that up. There's all kinds of people here. I don't mean people who come back occasionally, but people who live here in Woodbridge, and when that when that comes up, and when it comes up like this, why they said, "We got that. We did it." He went on to play semi-pro baseball, and eventually created a scout baseball in Mobridge through the Basin League. I'm Bill Spirey. I think one of the one of the things that stick in my mind most about Pat was is that when he made the baseball park, he would always go down to the jail and and take the people out of the jail and go up to the the ballpark. And he made that ballpark. Pat made it with a, a bunch of jailmates. <laughs> he would get them out, and they, he was always afraid that they would disappear. And he'd actually, I think, they might have lost a couple of them while they were working, but. I remember the most about Pat and how much he did for Mobridge and the baseball park and how he did it. He didn't do it in the usual manner. He did it in a very unusual manner. In the ballpark, and even the baseball players that played for him, it was big time. I mean, we had our own showers. I mean, who heard of such a thing in amateur baseball in the 50s? No, I remember a lot more about Pat, but I remember that especially. One of the other stories, and this one's true, is that when they were starting the Basin League, Pat was high official in the, you know, and running the mortgage thing, and and they came in and they they said, well, you've got a nice field, but your fence is too close, and so so he went in and took a paintbrush and changed the numbers and just repainted the numbers, and by the time the team came to look. To see if they've done it, they said, well, did you get your fence moved? Yep, it's all moved. <laughs> and they just went right on with the season. The first time I've ever talked to Pat Morrison was when I moved to Mobridge in 1963. I asked Morrison if he needed any more amateur ball players, And he says, no, he says, we got plenty. And I says, well, I'm going to play with Lowry then. He says, that's fine. I said, you're going to sign a release for me. He said, hell no, I don't need to sign a release for you. And so I played with Lowry. And did you beat him? And and that year, we beat him in the district tournament in Eureka, three to two. So there you go. Pat. That was the highlight of my life, one of them. So. Remember that he said uh, he kind of promised these guys, if you hit a home run, if this is a Basin Lake, uh, that Joyce will bake you a pie. 
okay, well, maybe that. There were some weeks when I was baking six pies because they really, and they got to choose their favorites most of the time. After that, after the six, I said, you'll get whatever I can make up. And I had three little kids, and so they would always help me deliver. So they knew these guys, too, when they would take it. They were staying in the basement of the old Low Clinic Hospital over there across from the uh, Mobridge Hardware. And so we'd have to deliver our pies over there. So Cal, New York. said, see, I played for Mobridge in the state tournament a number of times. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, I played for Eureka. And we were over here playing Mobridge, <laughs> and I had a move. I was left-handed, and I had a move for a few years there. Where I picked a lot of guys off for first base, and they never called me for a balk. And anyway, early in that game, I picked a young kid by the name of Jacobson off first base. And Pat really went upside, one side and down the other. He chewed him out so bad. And of course, the Mobridge fans remembered this. About two innings later, I won't admit to the fact that I may have walked him intentionally, but I walked him. I threw one pitch home and one pitch to first base, and I nailed him. He was flat-footed, picked him off first base. It was the third out of an inning, and the Mobridge fans, I'm playing for Eureka, I'm the enemy. Mobridge fans got up, gave me a standing ovation. <laughs> And he went the dog. He talked about it to Steve Steen a few years back. And he said, he went, Pat said, he went in the dugout. And he says, one of you guys has one word, you're out of here. <laughs> he was so embarrassed. This person would serve as athletic director for Mobridge High School and sports director for KOLY AM and FM. If you ask the countless people that he touched through his broadcasts, they would say that it was his special ability to make you feel and see the game in a new light. His wit and special attention to the non-obvious would give his listeners a unique perspective of the atmosphere in which he would share with you. For many years, the people that tuned into the morning and afternoon sports would listen to see what was said about the local kids and the national sports in a way that you would listen closely to see if the game that he was talking about might happen to be the Vikings and the White Sox. I always wanted to see that matchup, either on the diamond or on the gridiron. This is Mark Tobin. My favorite Pat Morrison memory would be, whenever I got into the area where I could pick up Coley Radio, I'd always listen to Pat, talk jock. Well, I was listening to the radio one night when uh, Mulbridge was playing football, and one of the Heil boys had gotten injured, so he was on the sideline that night. And Pat said that he had fallen off a pickup and was injured, so he wasn't able to play. And Pat said, I fell off a pickup one time, too. I can't remember if I picked her up the Legion or the Silver Dollar. You know, of the thousands of Pat Morrison fans, I've, I've got to be one of the luckier ones. I got to spend a lot of time with Pat traveling to ball games or just having lunch, so I've got a ton of memories. One of my favorites is from a Friday night a few years back. I'm, I'm in the stands at New Tiger Stadium. My radio is stuck in my ear, and my son's carrying the ball. Pat's doing a great job of keeping up with the play. He describes every cut and every block all the way to the end zone. And then he says, stay right there. We're going to break for 60 seconds, and when we come back, we're going to talk about that 83-yard run by Connor Stoich. Well, as you can imagine, I'm proud as a peacock, and I can't wait, and pretty soon Pat's back. And as only he can say it, he says very seriously, you know, during the break, we've been talking about that outstanding 83-yard run by Connor Stoich. I don't know. Maybe his mother was a track star when she was in high school. Like I say, I do not know. But one thing I do know is that Connor Stoich sure as hell did not get that speed from his old man. <laughs> and I was shaking my head. I can't, I can't believe he said that on the radio. Hi, this is Darren Boyle with Dakota Radio Group and Pierre. South Dakota sports fans lost a true friend with the passing of Pat Morrison. Pat was a true South Dakota original and a diehard fan of the Mobridge Tigers. For several years, I would run into Pat and Pierre at region playoff games as Mobridge was playing someone I was covering, and no matter what the game looked like on paper, Pat always was ready with a plan and uh, the intention that Mobridge was going to win and make the state tournament. My name is Parnell Fear, and I graduated from Mobridge in 1967, and I played all kinds of sports here, and I'll never forget Pat announcing the football games, and it was always so interesting, even when we were playing on the field, to, to listen to Pat, because he always was uh, amusing and would add a little more than 
what the average announcer was was or would do. And the funniest star, the story that Pat ever told me was the first time they did a broadcast, they did it from Claremont. And they got down there, they forgot to put the telephone line in. But there's a house right next to the ball field. So he went in and asked if they could broadcast from their living room. So they did their broadcast. They had to take their telephone apart and hook KLLY into it, make a direct line out of it. And they did the whole ball game sitting in their living room. And he said that's the first one they ever tried. Jim Shear, Mobridge High School, class of 1980. When I was in second grade, I hit an inside the park home run in Little League. And I got to go on coffee with the coaches, with Pat Morrison and, and I think John Saul and some of the other coaches. And it was in the spring, and it was the highlight of my athletic career, probably until we won the state championship as a team my senior in high school. So that's when I first really got to know Pat. But the best anecdote I remember from Pat is we went in 2004 to his Hall of Fame induction ceremony in the sports South Dakota Sports Hall of Fame. My brother and I, my dad, and there was a big crowd there um, in Sioux Falls, probably 250, 300 people, a very serious affair, and Pat was getting up and regaling the crowd. Everyone was rolling in the aisles, but the best story that Pat told that night is he said, you know, being a good basketball referee is like getting up and speaking in a dark blue suit and wetting your pants. Nobody knows it, nobody recognizes it, but you feel warm and fuzzy. And that brought the house down, so that was pretty good. But uh, Pat's one of a kind, a Mobridge legend, and he's been a good friend of our family, and so we're very happy to congratulate him on his 90th birthday and his very long and successful radio career. Hi, one of my favorite memories of uh, Pat Morrison was my early days in South Dakota back in the uh, early 1980s. Pat, of course, refereed basketball with uh, Leon Tutu Tobin, and both are uh, instrumental names and institutional names in South Dakota refereeing history. But I was doing a basketball tournament. It was a Saturday afternoon game of uh, one of the state tournaments in Sioux Falls, and uh, Pat and uh, Leon, I think it was the fifth place game, and Pat and Leon were refing the game. Well, Leon, of course, was a little over dramatic in some of his foul calls when he was describing to the table who the foul was on and this and that. Well, I saw Pat down on the uh, end line. He had the ball under one arm and had his uh, other, uh, other arm uh, on his uh, hip. And he was waiting for Toot Toot to get done telling the... Uh, official scorer's table who the foul was on finally pat you could tell got fed up and there weren't very many people in the building i mean it was an afternoon saturday afternoon fifth place game in the tournament and he just threw the ball down to the other end of the court and tutu didn't realize it and the ball goes into the hallway well when uh, tutu turns around looking for the ball pat's points where it went so he made he made uh, leon tutu tobin go chase the ball into the hallway bring it back and uh, the game resumed and uh, the fans got a big kick out of that one and and laughed and that was one of my favorite memories of pat morrison at uh, the state high school basketball tournament back in sioux falls back in the early 80s and a saturday afternoon fifth place game certainly uh, picked the tempo up i'm virginia tobin and my husband leon sometimes known as toot toot refereed with pat many 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 games and Pat would often come and stay at our house in Aberdeen and I remember and I would always wait on Pat as I waited on Leon and my one of my favorite memories is one morning I'm waiting on him and he looks at me and he always called me Smiley he looked at me and he said you know Smiley if I could have gotten a wife like you I might have gotten married <laughs> Leon and Pat spent a lot of time on the floor together they were great a great team, I think. But, you know, they also like to spend a lot of time off the floor. They had just as good a time off the floor as they had on the floor. And I remember the story I heard once about after you and Pat refereed in Pier, where you went a lot. Then they went over to Fort Pier and closed up the bar over there. It was called the Long Branch at the time. And as I heard the story, you're coming back through Pier, and there's a few red lights you go through. And a cop chases you down. And he pulls you over, and the cop said, you know, you went through quite a few red lights. Did you know that? 
and Pat said, hey, Toby, back it up and see if you can get them all this time. That's a true story. He was lucky. I mean, he was a pretty good cop. He was a decent guy. But anyway, this is like midnight or later. We were not, that happened very rare, of course. We were most of the time pretty serious. Boeing Patrick, I mean, uh, he, uh, he was the instigator. I was always the good guy. My favorite Pat Morrison story is when I was 15, during the state tournament, Pat, who always refereed with my dad, Leon Tobin, drove out to Rapid City with my dad, but he needed his car. So my mom and my brother and I drove to Mobridge, and then I got to drive Pat's hot rod car with one of my friends out to Rapid City. Had a sunroof, loud exhaust, it was quite the car for a 15-year-old to be driving. And when I pulled up in front of the motel, there were all the cheerleaders from Aberdeen Central, and they thought that I was pretty cool to be driving that car. So that's my favorite Pat Morrison story. And what's your name? Rod Tobin. I'm Alan Lightholt, and my favorite memory of Pat Morrison is 43 years ago, this past January, he called me, he called a tech, he gave me a warning in basketball, and he said, if you don't do it one more time, he says, I'll call a technical foul on you. So he's the only man in my life that ever, has ever called a technical foul on me. And what I'd done wrong was, when my team scored a basket, I picked up the basketball so the other team couldn't have a fast break. There were a lot of great memories about Pat as a coach, a referee, and a broadcaster, but Pat also had a wild side throughout his life, and many have some pretty great memories of Pat away from sports. Hi, this is Donna Severson. My favorite memory about Pat Morrison, I used to live next door to him and he had two, two poodles, a white one and a black one. When the white one would be in heat, he would put a pampers on it so that he wouldn't have to worry about it getting pregnant. So I know that he was conscientious about whether somebody would get pregnant or not. Hi, this is Sharon Martin, who worked with you for 10 years at the, at the, goal, at the radio station. Pat, the best member I ever have of you is our annual Christmas party, telling you all, all your fun stories, especially about Boom Boom down in Vegas. So that one always sticks in my head. So stick with the stories, and I hope you have a lot more stories to tell us. Love you. This is Carrie Baldwin. Um, when we were coaching volleyball, we were playing at, uh, practicing at Cheerhow Arena, and Pat came in to do a uh, coffee with the coaches tape because I was going to be gone at a tournament. And he comes in, and the girls are kind of giggling or whatever. And Pat's like, "Let's go in the office, you know, and we can um, do the tape or whatever." And Lindsey Kramer pipes up and says, "Be careful, Carrie. There's a couch in there." And the whole gym just started laughing. It was pretty funny, but that's one of my fond memories of Pat. I think it was in a dare. The back to back from Mobridge to from Glenham to Mobridge. And he backed down in the car. Well, of course, in the car. Who was all with you? Oh, God. Better not do that. <laughs> I'll lose the two hair I got left. <laughs> Oh, there's a lot of memories of Pat, but one that I can remember the most that sticks out to me is the the many times that I was working at the baseball fields that Pat would jog by in his in his uh, super high shorts and and little tank top. Um, a couple others. He's the only guy on the on the air that announces now who signs off in several different languages. Um, but most of all, his passion for sports and passion for kids and passion for the Tigers. This is Diane Dady, Pat. I don't t I've, I've told a few people, but I've never told you. I think it was about 15 years ago. I'm driving on the hospital road and just driving along, and here's this person in front of me. He's got the short shorts on. I mean, really short. And I'm looking at him, oh, man, that guy's got pretty good legs. And I'm thinking, oh, yeah, he's, he's looking good. And I turn around, here you are, Pat. So... That's my one of my fonder memories of you, Pat. Although I've always enjoyed you on the radio, and you make every game interesting, whether it's good or not. So, hi, this is Donna Severson. My favorite memory about Pat Morrison: I used to live next door to him, and he had two two poodles, a white one and a black one. When the white one would be in heat, he would put a pampers on it, so that he wouldn't have to worry about it getting pregnant. So, I know that he was conscientious about whether somebody would get pregnant or not. I have had a lot of opportunity over the years to share some of those stories with Pat and other people, but my favorite stories are the times I was able to partake. 
As everyone knows, Pat was always colorful on the radio, and his color would often cross the line, like the time he spilled water all over his stuff at Tiger Stadium. Pile up down around the 10 yard line, and uh, Bora will get around five yards on the play. Oh, for God's sake. Jesus, you stole my God, my heart on me. Hell. Holy smoke. So, let's see. We get, uh... One of my favorite stories with Pat was the last time that the Mobridge Tiger boys made it to the state tournament and drew their rivals Ron Colley for the first game. The Cavaliers had beaten the Tiger boys just weeks prior, but the boys were winning that night and time was winding down. Pat always had a hard time hearing the bumper music, which cued us that it was time to get back on the air. Pat started talking like normal, but he came out of the break asking me, Spence, do you hear that clicking noise? I thought there was something wrong with his equipment, so I started to go to work when he said, No, down in the stands. Thinking that he was starting his dialogue, I answered, No, Pat, I do not. He responded, Well, right about now those Ron Colley Catholics are getting pretty nervous, and that clicking is them rubbing their rosary beads together in prayer. I was obviously stunned, but having experience with Pat, I responded, Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Rapid City for the state tournament. And not realizing we were on the air, he stuttered and took over from there. Pat was always a fun guy to be around, and we will all miss him dearly for our own reasons. Since his passing, many of us were asked to share a few words about Pat. This is Dawn, the manager at Dakota Radio Group, and a um, great friend of Pat. Or I guess I could say family, uh, if you want to call it that. I met Pat 22 years ago when I started at KOLY, and I don't believe Pat thought I was going to make it here. He did tell me that QP would have fired me a long time ago, so I guess I, I beat what he thought. But, you know, there was a, a guy there that nobody really knew, like people that were around him every day. Um, he had quick wit. He had a loving heart. Even though he seemed really rough around the edges, Pat had a really big loving heart. There was days that Cindy and I would be up front and we'd hear some screaming and hollering in the back and usually it was him and Andy at each other's throats yelling about the latest sports or who we thought should win and who shouldn't win. My fondest memories of Pat was our Christmas Eve Every Christmas Eve, we during the day, we would take out the Tom and Jerry mix, the the booze, um, even though I'm sure my boss doesn't know about this. But uh, anyway, we would have invite some of the local people, and we would sit and have, have Tom and Jerry's and with our staff and whoever else happened to stop by. He had always had a good limerick. He had always had a good story. And... You know, the, the last one we had, he said, I think this is about over. He said, I think our Tom and Jerry party's about over. And he's right. We'll never have another one because that was Pat's thing. Having worked with Pat for over 30 years, I learned a lot of things. Like, agree to disagree with him most of the time. I learned every morning that he was going to be yelling down the hall, Say, Cindy! Because he needed his glasses glued, he needed something run off the computer, he needed me to fix the copy machine. He never knew what he needed. And every morning in the winter, I'd have to shut his car off because he'd forget it running out front so the windows would defrost. You could almost bake bread in there. It was so warm. But it was a good time, and I miss him already. Hello, this is Jimmy Hepper down in Missouri. I was saddened to hear that Pat Morrison had passed away, one of my great friends throughout his life. Uh, his sister went to school with my sister and so on. My mother was a good friend of Pat's mother. Um, talked to Pat last summer. His, uh, we went over a little bit of what he's done in life. He's accomplished a great deal, referee, coach. Most people don't know that he uh, had a chance to go with the Aberdeen Pheasants, a farm team for the Yankees, I guess, a long time ago. Pat was offered a chance to be on TV at KOTA when I worked there. They offered him a spot in sports if he'd take over the sports department. He turned it down because he liked Mobridge and he was ingrained in Mobridge and all his friends were in Mobridge. Also, I was there when Pat was offered a spot at KFYR Sports TV years ago, more than 40 years ago. He could have gone, 
he, he would have been a great sportscaster for KFYR. And I'm sure he had offers from all over the country. We'll all miss Pat. Uh, he was a good friend. I was the first disc jockey they hired at KOLY. Um, I was dumber than a rock. Pat took me under his wing and guided me through. We had two weeks prep before we ever got on the air, and that two weeks, Pat helped me immensely. That's when L.L. L. Coleman owned the station. Cupy wasn't there yet. Corey was the engineer. Pat was the sports, but that's the crew. And uh, without Pat, I probably wouldn't have made it. So I'm very saddened to hear that he's passed away, and he was a great friend great tribute to Mobridge because he had a lot of talent and he could have gone somewhere and done a lot more if he'd wanted to, but he didn't want to. He had the offer. I remember when he almost got married. Beautiful gal. She lived in Florida. She'd come up for the summer. And Pat told me he was getting ready to get married, but then he was undecided. And she said, I'm going back to Florida if you can't decide. But then he would have had to move to Florida. He didn't want to do that. So this is Jimmy Hepper reporting, and I'm down in Missouri, and thank you. Hello. Uh, this is uh, Jim Sheehan. Uh, I was uh, born and raised in Mulbridge and graduated in the class of 55, and my nickname back there was Shadow, which was kinder than many nicknames. But I have a couple stories about Pat Morrison. First one, uh, Pat was describing to me a basketball game that he refereed. This would have been in the late 50s in Java, South Dakota. And he was working this game with a guy named Bill Mateer, who had a nickname of Wheezy. So it was Wheezy Mateer and Pat Morrison. Now, many of you may have not seen Pat officiate a basketball game, but he had a certain flair about him that uh, that was endeared by some and not endeared by others. So the game had just started and the people are just uh, loaded in the gymnasium to the rafters and about the middle of the first quarter they're going down the floor and Bill, I believe, called a foul and the crowd got on him unmercifully. And they went down the floor the next time and the Crowd got on him again, and uh, Bill Mateer blew his whistle and goes up to the fan and he says, if you don't stop that, I'm going to kick you out, and uh, as Pat was telling the story, Jesus, he had never seen Bill Mateer act like this before, so, so the guy yells in a big voice, you can't kick me out of here, and Bill Mateer said, oh, can't I? Well, Bill and Pat ended up going down to the locker room and they told them that if they didn't get that guy out of the gymnasium in 15 minutes, that game was suspended and the other team won. Well, they left and uh, we laughed about it for years. And the joke that Pat and I had is every time I'd see him, I'd say, oh, can't I? And he knew just what I was talking about. My second story has to do with a baseball game at uh, uh, back in the 50s, early 60s, and the pitcher for Pat uh, was uh, was a friend of mine named Edgar Miller. His nickname was Punky, and Punky was a large uh, a large guy, maybe 280 and uh, heavy. And each time he would pitch the ball, he would grunt, making it sound. Uh, uh, even more, even even faster than it was. And <clears throat> Punky was known to be a little bit wild, so uh, Pat would tell me that uh, he'd go out and he'd tell Edgar uh, before the game started, he says, Ed, now when you're warming up, make sure you throw two or three pitches all the way to the backstop. And when you go out and warm up between the innings, make sure that at least one or two pitches go completely wild. We don't want these guys standing in there very comfortable on you. So that was that was his style and, and uh, I thought I'd share those stories. Thank you. I'll never forget 
the days that I've got spent with Pat Morrison. I'm a lucky person to have known him. Another story that Pat and I had together, I had a basketball game on the air, and it was Morbridge, and we were playing Lemon, and I won't say what he said because it got him in trouble. The next morning, I came into his office, and I said, Pat, did you say this last night on the radio? And, of course, I won't say it again. And he said, why, did you get a call? And I said, yeah, there was an irate mother that called me this morning. And he said, darn, usually you had 10. He said, I mustn't be getting very good at this anymore. You know, Pat, you know, he, he liked to do some things that would just make people get riled up. But people know he loved your kids and he loved the sport. And even though he might have made you mad with what he had to say once in a while, he loved the games and the kids. So when you think back about who Pat Morrison was and you think that maybe sometimes he was a little off color, yeah, he was. But he was off color because of his heart. The stories that man could tell, I know a lot of people and there are very few who could tell a story like Pat Morrison. I'll miss seeing him around and I'll miss his stories. During not just not just during Pat's final days, but for the past several years, I've watched as the gals down at the radio station have doted over Pat, almost like mother hens. And Don Conald and Cindy Daphnis continued to care for him right up until the end, cleaning his apartment and washing all of his clothes. Where else but in South Dakota can you find this kind of love? It was equally as touching to watch Pat's protege, Kelly Eisman, and his wife, Stacy care for Pat these past few years and keep their constant vigil. Kelly has broadcast hundreds of games with Pat over the years, and he traveled thousands of miles with him, and, well, Kelly and Stacy and their girls, Miranda and Madison, simply adopted him. I had the privilege of being with Pat in his final days at the hospital, right up until he took his last breath. And I can tell you this, these people, these people I just mentioned, were the children and grandchildren Pat never had. And I know from my many visits with Pat that he was so very, very appreciative. He loved them. Pat, you left behind shoes that'll never be filled. Thank you for everything you've done for our area, local sports, and for me. I'm going to miss you, Pat. Pat. You were a a one-of-a-kind, and I will forever treasure the memories. It was an honor to know you, my friend, and I am guessing you have the angels laughing already. Pat, we're going to miss you. Rest easy, Pat. Pat, thanks for the memories. Pat was such a great citizen of Mulbridge in the state of South Dakota. You'll be dearly missed. I'm saddened to hear Pat has passed away. Mulbridge has lost a great friend. Hope you've enjoyed as much as we did. We have enjoyed bringing it to you, folks. Without any more fanfare here, from the house on the hill, Aloha, Chow, Afwinze, Fayacondios, Arrivederci, Tascaraha, Yawo! This is Pat Morrison, uh, so long, everybody. (laughs) 